Houston. Three. Got it. The freshman delivers. When a team make a run, and the basketball game is made of runs, uh, our guys did an amazing job of keeping their ministry and understood that this is a game of runs and how they responded was perfect. Because this is a tough team that we faced. We knew it coming in. We prepared for it. We watched it on film. And uh, we knew every possession matters when you're playing this Buffalo. Great. That was my first time playing in front of friends, even though I'm a sophomore. Uh, the atmosphere that the Maiden Ridge run was great. You know, the Michigan fans in general were just great. It was it was loud in there. It was, it was, that was definitely loud. It was way different than last year. But the energy and the atmosphere is great. Uh, I hope we can tell you to play off that. That really helped us during the stretch where we went on that little drought. The energy that they brought. So, I mean, yeah, obviously, obviously, you don't want to lose the lead and, you know, make it close. And, uh, Juwan probably got a couple more gray hairs from that. But, um, you know, I think it was a good test for us, and a good showing of, the resilience because we are a younger team. So I feel like um, things like that uh, would definitely help us down the stretch. All right. Uh, good afternoon this uh, afternoon live. Thanks to the Big Ten Network for that Caleb Houston three. And you heard Juwan Howard, also Terrence Williams, and Hunter Dickinson after last night's uh, victory at Chrysler Center as we're ready to – Tip this one up here on this Thursday, this afternoon live. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Schnepp, AUC, on the screen. If you're watching right now, if you're listening on the pod, he is here, and he is the senior editor of TMBR, and it's great to see him. And uh, what's going on, Adam? Hey, Dennis. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, man. Well, you know what? We're getting fired up for the weekend. You know, you got uh, you got hockey tonight. You got uh, hockey tomorrow. You got both football and basketball going on. On the weekend and that f- uh, football game, uh, I don't know, the, the stakes seem pretty high. Uh, we're going to get to that, uh, you know, coming up. But but let's start with basketball. It's 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 fresh. It, it happened last night. They they raised a banner. They looked like they were going to run Buffalo out of the building. That did not happen. It ended up being a, a quite the game. But uh, what were some of your impressions? What did you think of uh, Michigan's performance last night? Yeah, kind of a tale of two halves, huh? Um saw a number of interesting things saw a little bit of lineup tinkering in the first half and you can see just how big this team can be if Juwan chooses to put a lineup like that out there I thought that was pretty interesting um, and then you saw I think the second half was a great test just to see what the lineups look like and what they can do when a game gets down to single digits um, you know a good way to open up the season with a, a little bit of a test that way yeah I think uh, for me the the surprise even going back to the exhibition, uh, contest that they played at Wayne State on Friday. One of the first guards off the bench, or the first guard, uh, Adrian Nunez, that was different, and that was a little surprised. We know they had uh, some injuries on Friday. We know also that Zeb Jackson wasn't available yesterday, but you know, uh, that's a little bit of surprise. And then to your point there with these lineups, when you have uh, a six eleven forward, our center at Musa Diabati, and you're putting him out there with a 7 2 Hunter Dickinson. I even think, uh, I think it was Robbie Hummel on, on the game last night. So that's an NBA lineup. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a matchup nightmare, right? And you saw Diabati can pass, he can get to the basket. Uh, I thought his defense was a little bit better than I expected it would be. Did a little bit of everything. And, you know, not to be overshadowed, Caleb Houston, I thought, was also as or more impressive. Uh, just so smooth. You know, these guys, obviously, they come in with the five-star profiles and, you know, you expect a five-star to eventually become that type of player. But these guys, I thought, looked really good right out of the gate. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I was ready. You know, uh, Diabati had the the seven points in the first half, and uh, he was real stat filler when you go through it. What do you have? Uh, yeah. Seven points all in the first half, five boards, three steals, two blocks. I mean, uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Three assists too. A little bit covered. Yeah, and you know, I, I don't. I'm not stealing anybody's thunder or, or anybody. You know, we talk about every single guy on that team, but but Diabati, even in that exhibition against Wayne State, and watching, I'm like, man, this guy's fun. You, it's like uh, you just don't know what he's going to do next. He can run, he can pass, he can dunk. You know, well, what can he do? Like maybe he's going to sell popcorn. Uh, Maze pop coming up at the at the next game, but. It, it, it's one of these things where it feels like, uh, you know what? He was a, a five-star, like, you know, to your point, you know, Caleb, 
uh, you know, ranked number eight overall, but you know, Diabati was there at 25. So it's not like a huge shock that he's out there doing all these things, but it's one of these things like, well, what can he do? And it's just been super exciting. I think uh, in the exhibition. And then of course, last night, you know, one other thing I thought was interesting, Dennis was uh, when the game did get close there in the second half, Houston was in the game. So if you're looking for who Juwan trusts, as far as the younger guys go, it looks like he's already earned that, um, and his minutes reflected that, I think, in the second half. I that was yeah, I'm like, you know, he hit his first shot, and then in the second half, uh, there was one time he airmailed one, but then to come back and, and knock one down right after that, that shows supreme confidence in your shot, not shying away from it. And it didn't look like he let everything come to him. There wasn't anything where you're like, oh, he forced that one or, you know, that wasn't a good shot. Every shot looked like, uh, you know, he'd say, hey, nice job there. Maybe he could have finished on that one, went up and dunked it and, or, you know, or finished a little bit better, of course, making it. But um, I got fouled. So uh, what are you going to do there? It, it, uh, I, I think he gets passing grades. I think everybody actually gets a passing grade uh, last night. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think to your point about sort of the way that he played, he plays within himself and within the system. And that seems to be kind of a quality he has beyond his years there. Um, and then Hunter Dickinson, if we're just talking about forwards and centers, Hunter Dickinson obviously was himself, which is good to see. And I think he had the kind of game that you'd expect an All-American to have to the point where it's not – even really discussed that much. I feel like from what I've read, from what I've heard so far, we're, we're talking about, you know, the forwards, the, uh, the younger guys and, and Dickinson just went about his business, but he's still going to be a heck of a problem for, I think that, you know, every team in the big 10. Yeah. I mean, his, uh, the accolades speak for themselves, but you know, he's a monster. He's, uh, I think he's one of the great basketball players at, at, at Michigan history. I mean, that that's how good he is. And, you know, he's going to be a problem for the opponent. It's great news for Michigan. Uh, everybody can feed off of him and what he's able to do because he demands a double team. So uh, that's why Michigan, you know, being number six in the country, and uh, there's going to be some teams that are going to lose this weekend. And, uh, Michigan going to be, uh, you know, heading up maybe inside the top four by uh, the next time the poll comes out. But all of that, like, you know, there's nothing that's uh, out of reach for this team this year, Adam. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And, you know, they did that with, I would say, limited guard play last night, right? Um, Eli Brooks, we saw, can run the one if he needs to. And that's great. That's that's wonderful to have somebody at the two that has that kind of versatility. But it, this isn't a, a guard-driven team necessarily. And... Uh, so if your guards do get in foul trouble, like last night, you see that it didn't really slow Michigan down that much. And that's that's probably going to be important here as the season rolls on. Well, I mean, they're, I think they're stacked and, and they're deep up front and in the backcourt. I think in different games, we'll be talking about Devontae Jones and Frankie Collins and when Zeb comes back and you know, just uh, you know how Nunez fits in there. And then, you know, whatever different lineups they're doing on the front line, all good problems to have. And things do look fantastic for him. I definitely want to get your thoughts as uh, I switch it over to the football field in the game on Saturday as uh, we think about Penn State. And just what kind of game are, are you expecting at noon in State College? Sure. Um, a very difficult game as I'm looking here at uh, Penn State's defense, to be honest. Uh, that's a really good defense. They have very good defensive ends. They have good linebackers and their their corners and their safeties are both excellent in coverage. So this to me is a matchup issue for Michigan, barring injury. Um, now, uh, don't remember his last name, but number 17, the defensive end, his numbers and what he looks like on film, it's, it's akin to an Ojabo or Hutchinson type player. That's a matchup problem right off the bat, right? Um, now, whether Lucada can go or not, that's going to be huge, I think, because uh, as I look here at the numbers on Pro Football Focus, uh, Jesse Lucada, the other defensive end there, he's solid all around. He's a good pass rusher. He's a good run defender. He's even fairly good if they drop him into coverage every once in a while. And um, if he doesn't play, complexion of the game changes to me, especially considering what Michigan's dealing with at running back and the injuries there. You know, we still don't really know who can go and who can't. It's always nice to have Hassan Haskins in the lineup, but um, 
for Michigan's offensive line, this is one of the, I think, stiffer tests they've faced this season. Yeah, I think that Penn State secondary is the best in the Big Ten. And, you know, just looking at – you're talking about some of those numbers there. I, I know that Travion Henderson hit him for over 150 yards on the ground, and Illinois as a team went over 350 yards on the ground. So maybe – Maybe it'll be Hassan Haskins being the key, and if he can shoulder the load. I know he had 27 carries. Maybe he'll, you know, go 30. Maybe he'll go 40. Whatever it takes there. But you know, that seems to be the key to me. But it, it feels like it's going to be a, a 20 to 17 type game. Get into the fourth quarter. You're going to have to make some plays uh, if uh, you know you're in the Michigan passing game. But if you're able to run the ball, that's going to be you know helpful for you. And being on the road, this one does seem like a toss up. Yeah, I mean, if you have a 100% healthy, stable of running backs ready to go. I like Michigan's chances, um, to your point about their run defense. But not a knock on Haskins. He's he's incredible. Obviously, he's incredible. Um, it's just, as far as how many dimensions does Michigan have, I don't know because I think that the passing game is going to come down to Cade McNamara's timing versus uh, the offensive line's protection, and it, that includes you know the coverage there from their excellent secondary, like you were mentioning. So... This might come down to what Haskins can do, and then obviously comes down to what the offensive line can do as far as uh, letting him get to the line of scrimmage and then, <laughs> you know, doing what he does where he makes a guy miss and pick up three, four yards, et cetera. Let me get some quick hitters for you here, Adam. When you look at um, the possibility of, of the injuries for Michigan and whether it's Andrew Anthony, Eric All, Blake Corum, it seemed like Jamon Green, you know, Harbaugh calling him, a, him and his brother, fast healers. It, it, it seems like uh, all was, uh, you know, as they say, trending in the right direction. So I don't know. Out, out of all those guys, and, and maybe there's some other players that I'm missing here, uh, whose injury do you think would be the hardest to overcome for U of M? You know, I was thinking about this earlier, and I actually think it's Green. Um, and I think that's because of what Penn State does on offense. Their running game is middling, and that's fine for them because they have Sean Clifford, they have Jahan Dotson, and they have other excellent receivers. And so if they drop back and pass, advantage them, uh, especially if Michigan's thin, which it does seem like they might be. So I think that injury could really impact how this game goes for Michigan. All right, when you put it all together, you're, you're looking at the numbers, you're – yeah, you're, you're matching up everything here. What did you come up with? What kind of score are you thinking about? We don't hold it to you. You can change your your mind before Saturday. I said twenty to seventeen, but you know, Adam, what are you thinking? I I think it's going to be right in that ballpark. I think you're right. I think as I look through things, I think that Penn State is going to hit some big passes. I don't think they're necessarily going to be touchdowns, and I think that then red zone defense is going to become really important. I could see Penn State getting down the field in a hurry and then ending up with a couple of field goals to come from that. Um, and if I had to make a prediction, I think I'm going to have to go, uh, let's see, Michigan 24, Penn State 20. I'll take it. I'll take it. What are your plans for the game? What, what are you doing on Saturday? Uh, I will be watching and then writing a takeaways piece right afterwards. All right, well, we'll we'll look for that uh, on TMBR after the game, the Maize and Blue Review. You're doing a great job there. It's the senior editor. It's been a lot of fun just a week in, and I can't wait. Uh, it's the first time I talked with you. You know, Justice was a uh, Brandon Justice, our uh, recruiting editor, was saying, "Oh yeah, Adam's great and everything." And he he said, "You talked with him." I said, "You know, I haven't really met him, so I, I don't know if I'd know you from Adam if we were out of the street, but I would now." So uh, it was great talking with you, and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, I do too. Thanks, Dennis. Great talking right. to you too. Yeah. Yeah, have a great day. We'll look for that piece coming up on uh, Saturday. I think we may have our next guest here. Let's go. There's this, there's this button. Oh, maybe not. Let's check it in here. How about that? Let's, uh, let's text our, our next guest. Let's take Adam's uh, stuff off the screen here. And let's see. Let me just send a quick text here. Let's listen to a little more of that audio. There's uh, little Caleb Houston from the Big Ten Network. Houston, three. Got it. The freshman delivers. And uh, right here is Michigan coach Juwan Howard. When a team make a run, and the basketball game is made of runs, uh, our guys did an amazing job 
are keeping the administrability. And understood that this is a game of runs and how they responded was perfect. Because this is a tough team that we faced. We knew it coming in. We prepared for it. We watched it on film. And uh, we knew every possession matters when you're playing against Buffalo. All right, and here is Terrence Williams. Right here. Great. That was my first time playing in front of friends, even though I'm a sophomore. Uh, the atmosphere that the Maiden Ridge run was great. You know, the Michigan fans in general were just great. It was it was loud in there. It was, it was, that was definitely loud. It was way different than last year. But the energy and the atmosphere is great. Uh, I hope we continue to play off that. That really helped us during the stress where we went on that little drought, the energy that they brought. So it was, it was a great atmosphere. All right, and one more before we connect with our, our guest, and that comes from Hunter Dickinson, was asked about the ball game. I mean, obviously you don't want to lose the lead and, you know, make it close. And, uh, Jerome probably got a couple more gray hairs from that, but, um, you know, I think it was a good test for us, um, a good showing of you know, resilience because we are a younger team, so I feel like um, things like that uh, would definitely help us down the stretch. Um, all right, there he is, uh, Hunter Dickinson, and we're having connection problems video-wise with Jim Scarcelli, but let's go ahead and, and fire up the uh, the phone here and see if we can get him uh, via the phone. You just have to look at me, and that's all right. Hey, Danny. There he is, uh, Jim Scarcelli, joining us here on this uh, afternoon live. Hey, it's great to talk with you, Scar. Everybody's fired up about uh, you know the football game this Saturday and then the basketball game last night. Let me hear your thoughts first on – on the basketball game, I know you watched it. Juwan Howard's team, they have uh, lofty expectations this year. And, you know, they look pretty good for openers last night. Hey, I wouldn't want anything better for us if I'm coaching that team because that's a good team. Buffalo's a good team. And just to schedule them, you know, take some courage like uh, some of those uh, announcers talked about. But I thought we looked good. I thought our freshmen looked good. Uh, Hunter looks leaner, stronger. He's better. I thought he'd. Uh, they're giving Nunez a shot. He made. He's got a lot of playing. I was surprised as much as much uh, of an opportunity they gave him. Uh, Williams looked good. He looked better. He looked leaner. You can tell these kids are in the weight room. You know, he looked. Uh, he made some shots. He looks confident out there. I'm going to tell you a guy. I analyze all of them, Danny. I'm going to tell you a guy that I'm. I'm big on. I watched him last year in high school. Is Frankie Collins. He's going to be the next Carson Edwards. You watch that little point guard. That kid is. He's going to be something special. But we all wanted to see the get the, the transfer guard, Devontae Jones. And I thought he was uh, I thought he was everything we talked about. Uh, he's a good defensive player. He made his free throws. He's a smart kid. He, he you know, he ran the offense a little bit. Diabati, you guys talked about him. He's a you can see the five star talent. You know, he's a shot, he's a rim protector. Uh, he's got a little offensive game. The only thing he's got he's got to make free throws. You know, we got to make free throws at the end of a game. So but yeah, he is definitely a five-star kid. Um, Houston looked good. You can you can see the intelligence. You know, he, he's a skilled kid. He can make shots. Uh, but you know, but with him, if I'm looking at Michigan, he's got to defend. You know, he's got to get stronger. He's got to defend a little better. Uh, what else did I see? Brendan Johns, just you know, he, he's getting an opportunity. He's just still making mistakes. I still he's got it. You know, the, the the moving screens and some of those kind of things. But Eli Brooks is our, you know, him and him and Hunter were our leaders. Without them, we don't win that game. Eli Brooks is the, he's the calming leadership influence on our basketball team. And he's, uh, he's solid, man. But it's a, it's a great win. I think we'll improve on defense more than anything. We got a lot of room on defense and they'll, they'll get some of that switching straightened out. But, um, it's a, uh, we should be, I, I'm, I'm feeling great. I thought it was a great win. Yeah, I think you're on top of everything there. All the all the stuff that you're you're saying there rings true. You know, your your point about Frankie Collins, this is uh this is why it's set up so nicely here when you analyze this team and just look at the the rest of the year. Uh I think Frankie Collins could be all those things that you said. They don't need him to be that right away. You know, they can bring him along, whether it's spoon feeding him, whether it's making him earn it, whether it's making him, you know, share some time. They got Zeb Jackson who was out because uh, of an illness last night, but you know, when you have two 23 year olds in the backcourt with now with uh, Devontae Jones and with Eli Brooks and a calming effect, you know, you can spot Frankie Collins and, you know, whenever, maybe by the time you get to February, he's up to full speed and you won't call him a freshman anymore. But that's the luxury that every coach loves to have to be able to spot guys like that. And, and it's a little bit true with some of the guys up front, too, because they do have 
a, a little bit of a rotation here when you're starting to talk about uh, bringing in Terrence Williams on, on, the, on the front line. And, uh, you know, they could go big and uh, put, you know, they, basically two seven footers out there if they have uh, Dia body. So a lot of nice uh, rotations, a lot of things that are like uh, on the front line and in the backcourt. Yeah, definitely a lot of depth. Yeah, he's got uh, he's got a lot of a lot of places he can go for different things. And you guys talked about the the change in the lineup. I didn't know if he wanted to do that offensively or or if what Buffalo did forced him to go bigger. But um, uh, Diabati, he's definitely going to give you the ability to defend a lot of different. He can defend a lot of different positions. He's a really athletic kid. So if, you know, you get him caught on a guard or or whatever, he can uh, he can defend. But uh, yeah, there were a lot of good things, and there's nothing. They're going to do nothing but get better because they're so young. So many young guys that were getting opportunities out there. But it was good to see the older guys get, you know, like Williams. Like I said, get, you know, show improvement. He's going to challenge John for a lot of playing time, I think. Yeah, and you know what? Sometimes you, you have some of these guys uh, they they relish the role of a sixth man. You know, maybe that's what it'll be here. He's just a sophomore. He it was the first time he really played in front of a. Well, no, it was the first time he played in front of a crowd. Uh, you know, after last year, he talked about that after the game. And so, you know, maybe it'll be perfect. Like, uh, you know, Shawnee Brown could have started last year for Michigan, but, you know, he was such a great energizer coming off the bench. And, you know, those things develop. I like that. You know, Diabati, he was one of four from the free throw line. But, Scar, when you when you watch his uh, his form, it looked pretty good. I'm expecting him to be better than a, certainly a 25% shooter, but he looks like he could be a, you know, 60, 70% free throw shooter and all the form, the release and everything up there looked really natural and looked pretty good. So maybe that's just a wobble in the first game. Yeah. It's just, you know, that's his first game dealing with the stress of, of you know, his first college game. Yeah. You, you're absolutely right though. The technique was there. You could see the skill. He just needs more repetitions, more pressure, free throws. And and he'll be squared away. But we like I said, we got to make uh, we we got to do a better job on defense. We gave him a lot of a lot of open looks, uncovered guys. We didn't switch uh, as well as we should have in, in many situations. But Joanne will get that straightened out. Yeah, he, he's got a few games. You know, you don't overlook anybody. But you know, a Prairie View uh, coming up this Saturday, and you know, then they've got two tests uh, next week. A late night game against Seton Hall. We'll see. They were picked uh, in the middle of the pack of in the big in the big East and then UNLV out in the mountain West, that's going to be a, a late, late night game. But um, you know, the running rebels were picked in the bottom half out there in the uh, mountain West. So if those seem like they can be uh, two wins, at least on paper and, you know, they'll be able to sort some of those things out, defensive rotations and everything. Not like you, uh, the curtain goes up and everything's perfect. Although in the first half through the first 15 minutes, it was about perfect. Yeah, everything looked great. Yeah, we were a pretty confident bunch then. But and that's why I think this was a great win because we, you know, we, you, you really got tested mentally. You know, we did some great things. We got the big lead. Everybody's happy. Everybody's smiling. And then guess what? They're making a run. And now we get tested. Now we got to make pressure free. And we didn't make a couple pressure free throws, which was a little discouraging. But we had to make some free throws there because they got down to five points at one time. And uh, that's why, again, that's why it was a great win because we were up, down, and, you know, we were challenged mentally, and, uh, and Juwan shows his poise, and the kids showed poise, and uh, just a lot of great things. I, I did take a look at Seton Hall. Seton Hall, is got, they got like four transfers. They got a whole new team. Uh, they'll definitely be a test. So, And then we go to UNLV. I, think, I don't know if we're playing on their home court, but, you know, that's basically a road game. So those, those would be competitive games. Yeah, and you know what? I, I know you coached some – uh, some basketball scar you uh and and unfortunately i could tell you that i've missed the front end of some one and ones and you know n- n- nothing the coaches hate more or, or your, yourself you, you hate more than not being able to make that first one and uh, and that's right around seven minutes to go it gets down to five and it's like woo but they, they played some defense terrence williams came up with a big shot they played some more defense came up caleb houston hit one and away they go. So they had some pressure points there. It just wasn't a runaway win. So everything looking good there. Any, any, anything that I didn't uh, hit on with the basketball team before we go over uh, and hit the football game? No, I took a look at Ohio State. I took a look at Michigan State. You know, we, it's just going to be about like, how fast are we going to improve? How fast are we going to come together? Because those teams are beatable. And I think you guys hit everything today, but we should feel confident as uh, Michigan basketball fans. It's uh, it's an exciting season. After what happened last year, there's uh, every indication to be just as excited uh, for this year after the debut last night. 
All right, uh, uh, Jim Scarcelli, let's move over to the football game. It's just going to play uh, take place Saturday in Happy Valley. These two teams, you know, uh, Penn State's strength looks like it's there because it is their their pass defense. Michigan strength, I would say, is their their rush offense. So. It, it, when you think about Michigan having the ball here, it, this seems like it's going to be a Hassan Haskins day, maybe getting 30 carries. You think he's up to the task there, or, or am I missing something? Well, I mean, we got to be balanced. We're going to have to do both. You know, they're, they're, in my opinion, Danny, and we talked about, I just, I think this could, this is going to be the best defense we've seen to this point. I think they have, uh, they have the best players we've seen. They got, you know, four star, five star kids in there. Uh, their defensive line is solid. They'll have, rotate a bunch of guys. Their linebackers are solid. They'll have, they got a lot of depth, and their secondary is strong. Um, but uh, we're going to have to do both. We're going to have to do both. And I, I'm really impressed with their coach. I think their coach is 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 um, is really good. He's going to he's going to give Josh Gaddis uh, problems, and we got to we got to be ahead of the game. We got to win some of those get those some of the chess match. But um, they got real good athletes. And, um, you know, we got to secure, if we secure the ball, like we've been, let's secure the football and yeah, they're going to stop us at times, but if we can secure it and, uh, and, and do a little bit of both, put them in conflict, we should be okay on offense. Well, let me flip you over onto the defensive side, uh, Penn state. This is not a team that's, uh, looking to pound the ball between the tackles. Sean Clifford is going to be airing it out. Like that's uh, the name of the game for them. They can't run the ball. So it, it seems like a real test for, the Michigan secondary, but I like how it sets up for the Michigan defense. Of course, when you have Hutchinson and Ajabo coming in and meeting at the quarterback like they can do, nothing's going to help your secondary out more than a uh, stout pass rush, and right now Michigan's getting that, so I, I think it's advantage advantage Michigan when Penn State has the ball. I like how it sets up, at least, uh, as we're sitting here on a Thursday looking at the game. I really like what we're doing schematically with Coach McDonald against this offense than what we've done in the past. I'm going to keep beating up the past, but I think we're, we're a little sounder. We're a little better, better structurally, I think, to stop this, uh, this. This is an RPO team. This is a true RPO team, run-pass option. You know, Clipper's going to put the ball in the gut of his running back every, down there every down, and then he's going to make some decisions. They're going to have – he's either going to give it to the back or he's going to keep it himself or he's going to drop back and throw it. But their offense usually starts with that. And um, I don't know if it's, you know, they haven't scored as, as much in the past, but they're still tough to defend. And, you know, we got to stop the quarterback run. The quarterback run is a play that, that Rutgers ripped us with. This is really the same thing we saw against Rutgers, only a little better version of it. That's how I look at their offense because they're doing a lot of the same stuff. And, they're, again, they're just a little better at it. And they got a tough running a quarterback that can run just like Rutgers did, and we got to do a better job of stopping that play. But um, you know, we got to get off the field on third down. They were un- this guy. They, they were unbelievable against Maryland on third down. How many third down conversions they've had? I don't know if you looked at that film, but I mean, they were unbelievable. We got to get off the field on defense. But I feel good. They're not going to re- they're not going to run the running back against us like they have in the past with what we're doing schematically. You know, the film that I did watch, again, was the Michigan State tape. And, you know, the one thing that Michigan State did is they presented that tempo that got Michigan and some personnel uh, switches and things like that. Indiana came out of the gate and tried a little bit of that. But, uh, you know, they got behind and whatever. It wasn't their bread and butter. I would think Penn State will have looked at that. And with an RPO, they'll be... I think standing up at the line and having the ability to to go quicker. Uh, what have you seen there from Michigan since the during that Michigan State game? Since the Michigan State game, is that something that you think um, when you, when you talk about Mike McDonald that that's that's a real correctable type thing when you talk about uh, the personnel swapping in and out? Oh yeah, I mean I, I don't know where that went wrong against Michigan State. You got a guy up in the press box that's looking at personnel from for the opponent you know and somebody against Michigan State must have thought they were making a personnel change and and community that to, to coach um, because he's on the field and he's not looking at he's not able to see that because it's on the other side of the field that somebody in the press box probably miscommunicated that on those occasions and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that assistant coach got uh, had a, had an earful but I believe that that because we haven't we didn't really have that problem other than other than that game. I think we may have had it once against Nebraska, but you know it's not a, a constant thing. 
I don't know if Michigan State was doing something to, de- to deceive that, like they were making changes, and, you know, and deception is okay. It's part of football. But whatever it is, we made mistakes. We weren't getting proper communication. I see. I don't see that as being a problem. We just got to get – because um, I just don't see that being a problem anymore. I'm sure that problem is corrected. Jim Scarcelli, you're, you see his name there on the uh, the bottom of the screen. He's on the, the line here and talking about Michigan-Penn State football after talking about the basketball game last night. So what type of game are you anticipating here? You, you think more of a, a lower scoring variety? Adam Schnepp said uh, 24-20. I'm looking at 2017. I would say that's uh, in the lower side here. Uh, what kind of game are you expecting? Yeah, I think you guys are right in the ballpark. I'm, I'm, I'm right around there, 27, uh, 26, Michigan. I'm, I mean, I'm right there, last second field goal. And it's, uh, they have the ability to score. You know, they're, they're, Rutgers moved us on it, same type of stuff. We got to do a good job, but we can move the ball against that defense. So, it's, you know, it's going to be tough moving it, but uh, Michigan with a kick at the end, 27-26. Oof, I don't know if I'm ready for a kick at the end type game, but uh, <laughs> if it goes through, I'll, I'll take it, you know, I'll, I'll take it. All right. Well, Scar, I've got, I've got two features that I want to get to and, and uh, I want you involved in both of them, the Michigan recruiting spotlight and the memorabilia minute. For those that don't know, you played at Michigan coming out of Warren, Michigan. You could have gone anywhere. You, you went to Michigan. You played with Jim Harbaugh, you played with Bo on that coaching staff where uh, Gary Moeller and Lloyd Carr. And then later, as you were a high school coach, you were involved with the Michigan football camp for, I don't know, so that's when, when Moeller and, and Carr, so you coached with those guys as well later on, uh, you know, at, at some of the practices, whether it was uh, with Rodriguez or Hoke or whatever else. You've been around an awful lot. I, I wanted to ask you about the Michigan football camp and, and just how much over the years, you think that you've identified players there and just how valuable that is when it comes down to the recruiting process. Yeah, I go way back with the Michigan football camp. I'm going to give you a little history here, Denny. Uh, 1975 is is what I believe uh, was the first year of it. Bill McCartney was the guy that had the idea, and Tom Fagan was the Ypsilanti High School football coach. Those two together started the first camp and uh, people really weren't doing it then. And, uh, and, and, and they wanted to put on a great camp to teach football. And I don't know how much recruiting was part of the, uh, the, you know, the, the motivation, but it was, a, it was a great week for the kids. And, and, and the coaches really prided themselves on giving the kids their money's worth and teaching them football. It was the technique camp. They called it technique because we're going to teach Technique, it was, it, was a, it was a one-week camp. You had about 150. It got to the point, I went in 1979 and 1980 as a junior and senior in high school. And we there was 150 college coaches. There'd be 150 high school coaches. And there were over 3,000 kids. It was the biggest camp in the country. And, uh, you know, people came from all over the country. You had players from everywhere, California, Texas, everywhere came to this camp. And uh, it, it developed a great reputation. And, you know, Michigan was using it to recruit like crazy. Yeah, they, they were, because uh, there were great prospects there. And um, I remember as a young guy, what Michigan did, they would pay for a bus and it would start in Gross Point, at Gross Point North High School. And that bus would go along I-94. It started at Gross Point North High School. It would stop at Kettering High School. And it would stop at McKenzie High School. And the guys that they were recruiting, they would give them the opportunity to get on that bus because some of them couldn't afford to stay at the camp. You had to have a little more money to stay at the camp. So the bus was loaded with all the, the highly recruited guys. I was one of the guys that was, was told that, you know, you can, you can take the bus up and drive up every day. And I just remember that when that bus would pull up, even though there's 3,000 kids at that camp, Coach McCartney would, would be waiting right there at that bus with all the highly recruited kids from the Detroit area, you know, the different uh, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb counties, they would uh, get to that bus. But that was a, a the NCA eventually uh, made that illegal. But just a little story, I thought I'd throw that in. I, re- I remember meeting Bob Eufer at the camp. Because Bo used to walk around with Eufer. And, you know, and he would, the guys that they're recruiting, they would bring Bob Eufer around, you know, talk to the talk to the players and 
I remember Bob Euford said this to me. He said, son, the two most important decisions you're ever going to make in your life are, are what college you go to and who you marry. He looked at me and said, they both start with them. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I eventually I ended up working the camp. I worked the camp for about 20 years and uh, got to know a lot of great, uh, great young coaches. And, and, uh, and we, we always, they always had a way of, of, you know, identifying the best players and we would always put them in the same group. And that would be the group that, you know, that would always get a little more attention, but uh, it was always run by the, the camp was always run by the, co- the, de- the defensive coordinator. So coach Mack ran it for many years. Then it was coach Mo. Then it was coach Carr. Then it was coach Herman. And, um, I used to send my players to the camp as a coach. I sent them every year because it was just, it was a, it was a great from a learning standpoint, but it was also great, you know, to learn football, but it was the kids got to see, you know, what kind of competition is out there. You know, every, every kid thinks he's a college football player. Uh, Well, send them to that camp with 3000 kids that are really talented kids. And now you say, wow, okay, this is what the, you know, this is the standard. This is what I got to get to. I'm going to throw a quote at you that I always remember to this day. I remember it because coach Mack started every day with it. What the mind can conceive and believe the body will achieve. He used to have 3000 kids barking that out every day. So mentally there was a lot of good stuff that the coaches were instilling in kids that, you know, that you might not get from your high school coach. So I thought it was great from the mental standpoint and then you're they're teaching football but uh yeah i got to, i and, and, and in me as a coach i got to work with a lot of the uh you know jimmy herman was a friend of mine he and he ran the camp for many years so i would always change with different position groups one year i'm working with the offensive line with coach the board next or with coach miles or the next year i'm working with uh you know stan Parrish and the quarterbacks i remember working the camp when drew henson was there you know this kid was a 17 year old kid. He looked like a man, you know, he was unbelievable. And I remember working with Braylon Edwards were there. And, and I, I, I used to listen to the coaches talk about the players and, and who they're recruiting. And it's interesting. And, um, one of the things I used to do, cause you're always, you know, I'm a, I'm a high school coach trying to learn football and these co- big time college guys, they're there trying to recruit kids. So you, you know, they they don't always have time to sit down and talk with you, but we would all eat our lunch together. Right. So I would find a guy I want to talk to. I remember I cornered John Harbaugh one time at the lunchroom and, you know, Hey John, you know, he's sitting right next to me. Now I got him for a half hour and we're talking football. And I remember I got our punt, our punt coverage from, from John Harbaugh. And you just, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity for high school coaches to learn football, but the, the college, you know, recruiting was a big part of it. But let me say this in defense of the Michigan coaches. They always wanted to make sure that the kids got their money's worth from a coaching standpoint. They were, they were, they never wanted it to just be a recruiting thing. You know, they wanted the kids, even the kid that's not a, not going to play college football. You know what? They wanted that kid to get a fair shake and get his money's worth. And, um, but the camp was up and rolling for, you know, for 40 years. It was, it was great. No, no, not 40, you know, from, from 75, you know, Bo and Mo and Lloyd. And then, and then when, um, you know, when Rich Rod got hired, that's when it, he, he kind of knocked it down to more of a one day, just kind of more of a recruiting thing. Um, it just became a one day camp. And that's kind of where it stood. Brady, when Brady got the job, he tried to build it up again. And I don't know that it ever really took off uh, like it had been, you know, the biggest camp in the, uh, in the country, but, Coach Harbaugh has a camp. He's got a one day camp for young kids, like eighth grade, maybe seven, eight, nine. I don't know. And then he's got a, he's got a, he's got a really a half day camp for uh, the older kids, the, the 10 and 11 grade, 11th grade kids. So it's, it's really become just mainly for recruiting now. And you know, you're not going to teach a kid anything in three hours. That's why I looked online. That's what it is now. It's a three hour camp. So it's probably primarily just for recruiting now. And, um, but that's kind of the history of it. I got to work with, you know, I remember Butch Jones, you know, I, he was a young guy at Ferris State. I remember working with Butch Jones, you know, and I remember working with Les Miles and uh, Cam, 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 Cam Cameron was a, was a young coach, you know, and he worked the camp. And of course, John Harbaugh, he was at Cincinnati uh, for many years as a coordinator. And I got to know John pretty good and obviously knew him through Jim, but um, 
I'm going to say this, Danny. You know the satellite camps that Coach Harbaugh tried to uh, initiate and had for a couple of years? Yes. Okay. I thought that was the greatest idea. I thought it was the best. Th- you know, everybody in the NCAA talks about all the time, what's best for the kids, right? Let's do what's best for the kids. Okay, so the Michigan camp, you have to have money to come. You have to have somebody to get you there. It is what it is. Most of the kids came from the Midwest. But the satellite camp, I thought it was a great concept because everybody doesn't have, you know, the ability to, to, to come to Ann Arbor or even for an unofficial visit. People can't, a kid from all over America can't come to these different schools for unofficial visits. That was an opportunity to, you know, teach some football and let, the, let a kid in a different area of the country get exposed to Michigan and learn about Michigan. And and I was so upset with that when the when the NCAA uh, said you know you can't do that. And I, I remember hearing Paul Feinbaum ripping on Harbaugh about the satellite camp. And I I just thought that was so so wrong. You know he's defending the SEC. You know go back up north, leave our SEC kids alone, and you know don't come down here and take our kids. And I just thought it was ironic how 60 years ago they didn't want their kids. You know they went up north to play. And, he, and here we are, Harbaugh is trying to go around the country to get, you know, give kids an opportunity to learn about Michigan. And uh, eventually, the, any, anyway, the NCAA, you know, mixed it, so you can't do it anymore. But I thought it was a great concept. Anyway, now we're a one-day camp, and I don't know how, how big a factor it is in recruiting, but it used to be a huge thing because Michigan got a lot of kids. You know, they got to see him. They got to meet him. They got to watch him run drills. You got to see him lift. Gillison would work with the guy, and you know, you could you could see him run. And so it was it was really good from from that standpoint. And you had you had all the Mac schools there. Every Mac school was there. Every Division two school, and, and and you know, within 500 miles of Ann Arbor was there. You never had, but but then you also know this: you, you, no one else was ever invited. No other big school, no other Big Ten school was invited. The only the only school I think they used to let in was Indiana. Because we had a, we always had a good relationship with you know, Coach Mallory over there and, and some of those guys. Sure, sure. You know what? Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking with Mike Martin, who went to to CC and came to Michigan as a defensive lineman. And I don't know why we started talking about camp. He started telling me the story about how he went there, and I don't think Michigan was recruiting him. I don't know how many offers uh, he was getting, but he went over there and he was like, "I, I just got to get the attention of uh, of Lloyd Carr." And he said, uh, you know, he just went out there with the idea that he was just going to tear it up and show them that, you know, he deserved a scholarship. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. He went there, made a mark and, uh, you know, had a great week of camp. I never talked to Lloyd about that. But, you know, that was one guy. Are are there any uh, anybody else that comes to mind over the years that, you know, came in that you might have just thought, hey, this is a, you know, player that is coming to camp here. We're not really interested in him. And then when he's leaving, you're thinking about, hey, let's offer this guy a scholarship. You know, I, I just know that. Um, oh boy, I don't, don't want to. There's a couple guys that I know of that played at Michigan that had great careers. That I know there was there was some questions about them. You know, there there was some back and forth about about you know whether they could play or not. And um, God, I just don't know that I really want to talk about. I just okay. I'm going to mention one kid. I, I do remember. <laughs> I don't. I do remember back and forth discussion about Braylon Edwards. There wasn't there wasn't a, a, a total buy in from all of the all of the coaches. That works. And well. obviously, yeah, obviously. But so anyway, that's that's what you would hear and that's what you would see. And you were able to, you know, every coach could could watch a kid run drills. You could watch him catch passes. You know, you you're 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 right there. You got the kid for a whole week. You can see how he interacts with other other players. So, you know, it, from a from a really uh, recruiting standpoint for the coaches, they got a chance to really size a guy up. And um, but yeah, I do remember that discussion. And um, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, over the days and weeks, uh, there'll be plenty more uh, stories and situations that will pop into your head, and you'll be able to share them with us. Uh, you said that you'll join me Saturday, 10 minutes after the Michigan Penn state game concludes. So we'll do a post game right here. That's going to be fun. Uh, the last feature that I have here on afternoon live every day, I go to the memorabilia minute and I pick something close to me here in studio. And, and I just talk about it for one minute. Uh, that meant anything great, you know, a couple pictures, a couple cards, anything else. But I figured in, in your office, somebody who's, been involved in football his entire life you've got to have something 
that you know you could tell us about here for the memorabilia minute that people would be interested in scar what do you have you know danny i wish i could i i'm having a little trouble here with this tech technical deal here but i wish i could show you i have my helmet my last football game was 1986 fiesta ball and it's sitting right behind me i'll show it to you saturday we get things figured out okay nice. that helmet that helmet is right out of the locker room now big johnny if you're listening i'm sorry but i got it i got my helmet so the last game against nebraska you know, you've got your duffel bag, you got all your stuff, and you know, but in that bag, Denny, I had another little bag because I knew that helmet was coming with me and a couple other things. So I will show you Saturday the helmet. It's sitting right behind me. It's been with me since uh, my last football game, and, and that was a great memory, but uh, that, that helmet it will, will be with me forever. Well, it's a great tease because we will see you 10 minutes after – the game coming up on Saturday, uh, Jim Scarcelli, thanks so much for, for coming on here and talking with us here on this uh, afternoon live and getting us ready for Michigan Penn State coming up on Saturday. I'll be fired up, Denny. I'll talk to you Saturday. All right. We'll see you then. Take care, Scar. There he is, Jim Scarcelli. That is going to do it here for this uh, afternoon live. If you like Michigan football recruiting, coming up in a few minutes, Talking with uh, Brandon Justice, the recruiting editor here. Stay tuned for that.